Hello, everyone. Welcome to Munson Healthcare's COVID-19 press conference. Today is Tuesday, January 11th, 2022. My name is Diane Mihalik. I am the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Munson Healthcare, and I will be your host today. Next slide, please. Munson Healthcare has been offering these weekly press conferences since um, well, for over a year now, and we're happy to continue to do this to keep you up to date on the latest COVID-19 information. Uh, this week, we're happy to have our local health department experts back with us. So today, as speakers, you'll first be hearing from Dr. Christine Nefsi, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Munson Healthcare. Then joining us will be Wendy Hershenberger, the Health Officer for the Grand Traverse County Health Department. Lisa Peacock, the health officer for the Benzie Leelanau District Health Department and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. And joining us again will be Dr. Je Jennifer Morse, the medical director of District Health Department number 10. So we do have a lot of content to get to uh, today. Our speakers are gonna go through uh, their updates first, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A session. We'll get to as many questions as we can um, under our 50 or 45 minute uh, time frame we have today. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christine Nefsi, Chief Medical Officer for Munson Healthcare. Welcome Dr. Nefsi. Thank you, Diane. Always good to be back with my health care, uh, the health department colleagues, and you. So why don't we start off today uh, with the numbers. I think that everybody can probably see and is aware that we are um, seeing quite a, a surge in our numbers for COVID-19. So I'll direct you down to that bottom box, which has um, some of our state of Michigan uh, numbers. So we are at a 31.8% positivity rate. Um, that's quite a bit higher than what we've seen, and uh, that is translating into a high number of new cases across the state. Next slide. We are uh, similarly in our region seeing an uptick in our percent positivity. Um, so we are at a 19.7%. You can see the uh, daily average there of 22.2% is really an indicator for us that we will continue to see that number go up. Um, just as a reminder, the state now is updating these numbers every other day rather than daily as they were early in the pandemic. So we are seeing um, uh, updates only every two days or so. Uh, but you can see um, our, our cumulative cases have also increased. Um, the numbers that we're seeing on a daily basis are going up. I will say for those of you who are paying attention that there's a um, glitch in the feed on our cumulative deaths. So that number is not accurate. Um, from what we can tell tracking the numbers, we're actually regionally at 1,594 on our cumulative deaths, but um, we are working with the state to try to figure that out. But just so people aren't confused that the numbers are different in a, in a couple different places. Next slide. And there you can see um, our inpatient COVID uh, cases. So, you know, that lo long, slow uptick we've seen with the most recent surge, we did have a nice um, trend down and we are seeing our inpatient numbers trend up again. Next slide. Dr. Nefsi, before you move uh, on to that one, um, related to the, the trend curve there, mm -hmm. was this expected, is this, um, and I, do you think this is because of the holiday gatherings that we've recently had? Yeah, and I, I do. I think there's likely a combination of um, issues of why we're seeing this. So one is just the Omicron variant, which is highly contagious. So if we look at other countries, um, other states that are a little bit ahead of us with this variant, they similarly saw big increases uh, very quickly in their numbers. Ours, you know, just happened to be, you know, as we're seeing these new cases that are getting sequenced, it was from before the holidays. So there's no doubt that, you know, kids being home from school, um, family gatherings, travel, all of those things really had uh, come together um, to increase the opportunity for spread. And we are certainly um, seeing that as our percent positivity increases our numbers um, per 100,000 go up. And then hospitalizations are really a little bit of a lagging measure. Um, so we saw that decrease and now we're seeing that trend up, I'd say 100% um, due to that. 
I think, you know, the good news is that um, even though we're seeing the highest numbers of hospitalizations that we've seen in the state of Michigan with this pandemic, our ICU numbers are holding steady. They're not going down, but they're not going up dramatically either. So we do, we are seeing evidence that what was true in other countries, that this is a highly contagious uh, variant, but not quite as virulent is true. Unfortunately, just by sheer number, sheer volume alone of the cases, we are seeing a, an uptick back up um, for our inpatient numbers. Great, thank you, Dr. Nefsi. Yeah. So there you can see uh, we have 92 patients hospitalized across the Munson healthcare system with COVID-19. And as a reminder, we follow the state's definition of what that is. So these are patients that are hospitalized specifically for COVID-19 with the exception of our pregnant moms who are delivering. That is a one or two at any given time. So certainly not the majority of this, but um, other than those uh, couple of um, hospitalized patients who are delivering, these are all patients that are hospitalized for COVID-19. And that vaccinated number means um, fully vaccinated. So uh, not necessarily boosted, but the two uh, doses of an mRNA vaccine and two weeks after the second dose. Um, or one of um, the Moderna. So um, that is where, or sorry, of the J&J. &J. So um, that is the definition that we are using currently. Um, most of you have probably seen there's some conversation about fully vaccinated and vaccinated, but right now uh, that is the definition that we are using. We have been getting a lot of questions about how many of those vaccinated patients are boosted. We are going to probably adjust our graphic so it shows that at some point. I can tell you today, four of those 26 patients are boosted. Um, in our ICUs, again, 33 patients, only six of them vaccinated, and none of our ventilated patients are vaccinated. So again, just a reminder that uh, vaccination really is the best protection for you, um, especially if you're at high risk for developing complications from COVID-19 or are around family members or friends who are. Vaccination is the best way for you to prevent, prevent yourself from getting seriously ill and or hospitalized with COVID-19. Next slide. And then again, just by sheer numbers alone, we are seeing um, a very sharp increase in the number of pediatric hospitalizations. So the highest again we've ever seen since the pandemic started. Um, many of those children are quite sick. About 25% of the children who are being hospitalized for COVID-19 are in the ICU. Um, so uh, just something again, um, not that this is more virulent and that's why we're seeing more kids, it's just a volume number. So um, just because there are so many more sick kids and that certain percentage of um, kids will get sick, uh, that's kind of the, the boost that we're seeing there. Uh, we are hoping uh, just the last day that the numbers have gone down, but we need to see a longer trend line to see if we've reached the peak. Um, and again, this is a lagging number. So um, as you know, as we see our cases continue to go up, we would expect this to um, remain higher as well. Next slide. So um, I did just already mention vaccine, um, both the FDA and CDC do remen recommend boosters if you have been vaccinated. Um, recently, they did also approve a booster for children age 12 to 15. The FDA also did shorten the timing of the Pfizer's booster shot from six months to five months, um, just to make sure we get people in there and not waiting too long uh, between that uh, second dose and their third dose. And again, if you've received uh, Moderna, and you are 18 years or older, you can get a booster five months after completing your primary series as well. And then Johnson & Johnson, if you are 18 years or older, you can get a booster two months after completing that first shot. Um, and again, it is okay to mix and match those booster shots. Uh, you do not have to get the same shot that you got originally. Um, whatever is available to you, you are safe to get. Next slide. And then as um, 
we've been more into this winter season, which you can tell if you've walked outside at all this week, um, we are starting to see um, some flu. So we are continuing to follow that. Um, we've had a, just a handful of outbreaks and thankfully, um, while we are seeing uh, cases and some hospitalizations, um, the number is still relatively low. Uh, so we will continue to monitor that for you as well. All right, thanks, Dr. Nafsi. Uh, appreciate that update. And it is uh, a bit alarming to see the, the pediatric numbers increase um, so much. So I'm sure we'll continue to, uh, to track that in future press conferences as well. All right, um, Dr. Nefsi, we'll have you back in a moment uh, for the Q&A session, but next I would like to welcome back Wendy Hershenberger, who is the uh, Health Officer for the Grand Traverse County Health Department. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. All right, so I will continue on with uh, information specific to Grand Traverse County as far as our uh, current case numbers and trends. Um, it's going to mirror quite a bit of what Dr. Nefsi indicated. So for Grand Traverse County, uh, we remain at a very high transmission rate with our weekly case rates uh, significantly increasing over the past uh, few weeks. In the last week, uh, we've had 763 newly identified cases. So this is our highest number uh, for a week total uh, throughout this entire pandemic. We've had three deaths during that time. Um, that equates on the state dashboard for anybody looking at that to a, a rate of 530 cases per 100,000 population. So that's just a way to compare uh, county to county, but not just based on share numbers. Um, we're averaging currently 109 cases per day, which again is our, our highest seven day daily average, uh, 109 right now. Uh, when we reported out two weeks ago, we were at 38. So you can see it's almost tripled as far as daily cases in that two week time period. Uh, the, the Traverse City regional percent positivity uh, is at 17.8, Grand Traverse County is at 18.4. And we were notified from the state lab that we have had uh, Omicron sequenced uh, in uh, one of our samples, um, at, at least one so far. So that was tested back on December 22nd. So, um, it does take you know, 10 to 14 days for that lab to uh, sequence them. So again, this has been a significant increase in cases um, over the past 10 days. Uh, like Dr. Nefsi indicated, this is um, a combination, this start of the surge of it being uh, holiday gatherings, plus knowing that Omicron's uh, starting to become um, more prevalent, which is higher, higher, higher transmissibility. And then just a reminder, uh, the current uh, breakthrough rate, I know that's something we're asked about for the state of Michigan is 2.4% of people who are fully vaccinated who've reported a breakthrough infection. Next slide, please. Um, here, just showing our vaccination rates, uh, we uh, continue to see in numbers uh, increasing. So we're at overall 74.3% initiated and a 68.4% for uh, completion. And you can see in the age groups, a little bit of variability, um, continuing to make progress on the five to 11 year olds and um, 12 to 15 year olds. Next slide, please. So with uh, in the knowledge that we're you know, starting this, this larger surge, uh, we are doing uh, what we can to try to bring more testing to the area. We know that's something that um, is in high demand, not just here, but everywhere. So we are partnering with the Michigan National Guard and we have a new test location. Uh, we're going to aim to do testing two to three days a week. However uh, much we can secure the staffing for that test site. Uh, it also will be dependent upon the supplies that we're able to get. Um, so we have to take it week by week to see where we're at, but uh, the new testing site is located at uh, 1220 Airport Access Road. So it is near, but it is not in the airport. So it's not inside. Um, and that testing will start tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday, and then continue um, Thursday and Friday throughout the day. Uh, we will be issuing a press conference or a press release later today on some more specifics and how to get appointments. Um, we know they will likely go fast, but again, this is, you know, us partnering with uh, National Guard and 
several local community partners to try and bring more testing uh, to the area. Next slide, please. And then vaccination clinics uh, through the health department. So for the ages five to 11, those uh, continue at the main health department. Uh, those appointments are released Wednesdays at 10 a.m. for the following week. Um, and then our Cherryland Vaccination Clinic continues on. Uh, again, that's uh, staffed uh, for a combination of staffing from HANU as well as the health department. And um, appointments are required there. We do have appointments next week that'll be released tomorrow. Um, and also just knowing that we do have some appointment availability yet this week. So if you're all able to go out to that link, you can see where there might be opportunity to go get uh, first, second dose or a booster as well. So uh, continue to check our website and our social media. And we do ask if people are going to cancel if they just actually physically cancel the appointment because then that opens up the slot for another community member. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, this is just how to report if you've taken a, a, a test at home and it's positive. Um, we have been very busy with this uh, submission portal. Uh, just know that if you submit your results, we're looking for the positive ones. Um, you will get an electronic communication, which is a survey. Um, it is something that we uh, have to manually enter into the state system and then it's sent out. So with the, the sheer volume of cases statewide right now, there is a little bit of a delay on this, um, but you will get that information. And then we've also um, updated on our Facebook page um, some information and graphic sheets on what to do if you're positive, what to do if you're exposed. So pretty easy to follow along uh, on there. Um, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate that update and appreciate um, all the great work uh, you and your team continue to do in Grand Traverse County. Uh, we will have you back for the Q&A session shortly. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome back Lisa Peacock, who's the health officer of the Benzie Leona District Health Department and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Diane. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, echoing much of what Wendy said, we are, are certainly in the same situation across both of my health department jurisdictions. Um, we've seen record highs in um, the average number of daily cases being reported to the health department over the past week. Um, the health department in Northwest Michigan is at 154 cases per day and Benzie Lilana is seeing an average of 52 cases per day. Both of those numbers are significantly higher um, than what we had seen the, even the week before. So you can see in these charts here, um, the rise up in both Benzie and Lilana counties. Um, in weekly cases per 100,000. You can go to the next slide. And in the Northwest District, we've had many counties that are actually reaching a peak um, number of cases per week um, per 100,000. Um, so certainly Antrim, Charlevoix, and Emmett are all seeing that peak. We could go to the next slide. So it aligns with what we're hearing um, across the state, high positivity, high case rates um, continue to be the, the story of the day. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, in addition to cases, we are seeing our vaccination rates going up. Um, they typically have been going up slowly, um, but over the past week, we noticed um, more rapid increases than we had seen over the holidays. So we're really excited about that. And a couple of um, points that I think are important is that all um, six of the counties that my health departments cover are above 60%. Four of the six of them are above 70% with people who are eligible to be vaccinated five and over having had at least their first dose. And Emmett and Leelanau County kind of stand out with Emmett at 73% and Leelanau at 83%. So um, we, you know, we certainly want to keep, keep trying to get there. Um, there has been a huge strain on testing recently, and we do have testing sites available in each county. We also on our websites have um, a grid of testing sites really throughout the region, not just health department sites, but certainly um, pharmacies and other sites that are available for people. Um, we also have um, some you know, on our website, plenty of information about where you can get vaccinated. Um, we are combining our, in the process of combining at the Northwest Health Departments, the um, 
the COVID vaccinations for adults and children. So trying to simplify the process to make it easy for people to get scheduled in Benzie Lelana due to the different sites and staff that we're using, they are still separate, but still um, improvements to our website hopefully have made it um, a little easier for people to find exactly what they need. So this slide just gives you all of those links and um, you know we certainly are encouraging people to be tested. And I will be coming back um, in a few minutes um, to talk a little more about testing. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Appreciate all the hard work that you and your team continues to do as well. Um, and finally, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jennifer Morse, who's the Medical Director of District Health Department Number 10. Welcome, Dr. Morse. Hello. All right, so just kind of mirroring what everyone has said, um, we have seen increases in our cases. This data is a little bit old as we're seeing dramatic increases day by day. So um, we have seen increases as illustrated on this slide, but again, just in the last few days, things have continued to increase really over the last 10 days. The increases have been quite dramatic, especially for our more central counties. Again, with 10 counties, um, things sometimes average out and don't look as dramatic as they are, but some of our central counties are um, you know, in the 500 or higher cases per million and percent positivities are 20 to 30% in those central counties. Um, next slide. So as everyone has said as well, I'm trying to help get more testing availability because we know that is an issue. We have community testing sites, actually in seven of our counties, there are six listed here, but there also is testing available at um, Kirtland College in Grayling. Uh, but these six testing sites, we do have some data on. There was decreased testing over the holidays just due to closures from the holidays. Um, however, those testing sites continue to have between 16 to 27% positivity. So again, in Big Rapids, Kalkaska, Nuego, Cadillac, Ludington, Hart, and Grayling, there is rapid antigen testing and PCR testing available. Um, so if you are in need of testing, um, go to our website and, and know that that is available, hopefully uh, near to you, um, in addition to the other areas um, like pharmacies and such that it's available. So our percent positive or our percent vaccination rates have climbed. I did go back and look at what our rates were about two months ago. So our um, percent initiation has gone up. 4% over the last two months, and our percent fully vaccinated has gone up 3% over the last two months. However, as you can see with the lighter pink areas being the lower vaccinated um, areas, which is those 16 and older who have had at least one dose, um, we do have pockets that still have very low vaccination rates, um, and those can really be a risk for large outbreaks and large spread. Um, which we have seen again in, in some of those central most counties are where we're seeing some of our bigger rates and percent positivity. Um, I think. And then um, next slide. So we do still have vaccine available and readily available with lots of different appointments. Our vaccinations for the five to 11 year olds um, we're at about 13.7%, so lower than the state average. So we do have appointments readily available for everyone. Um, information is there on how to schedule. And we also now have a button if you've done home testing where you can self-report. Um, I know that this is my last slide. So there were just a couple of other things um, I wanted to mention. We have had three Omicron cases uh, verified in Nuego County. We know though that because of the delay in those reports that there is a lot more present and um, you know, large percentage of the tests um, the state are doing are for Omicron and um, it is expected that that is our dominant variant now at this point in the state. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we have recently had um, some calls from our residents concerned um, and questioning um, why we were notified of their test results. So I just wanted to remind our citizens that it is the legal responsibility of testing agencies to report positive COVID results to us, as well as laboratories. It is a, a legally reportable 
disease and it is responsibility of public health to follow up on those things. Um, our health department and some other health departments use different ways to contact our citizens. Um, we are using a texting platform. So if you do test positive, you will get a text from us. It does ask for your birth date as a way to confirm that we are texting the right person. So just a reminder that that is a normal thing to expect from us. And it will ask you to fill out a survey to get information from you as part of our investigation. If you fill out that survey, you won't get a phone call from us unless we need to clarify things. And you certainly can call us if you need more information. So just a reminder um, of the normal process, you know, as being two years into this, sometimes we forget what the normal process is. So if anyone have, has concerns or questions, you certainly can follow up with our health department. So I believe that's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Morris, and some good reminders there as we've, uh, we're kind of a year in or more into this now into all these procedures. So appreciate that, that update and everything uh, you and your teams are doing uh, for district health department number 10. Um, next, we're gonna do something a little bit different before we get to our Q&A session today. So we have gotten, um, and I think the health departments have as well, gotten a lot of questions over the course of uh, the week. There's been a lot of media activity and a lot of changes um, related to COVID. And we're gonna have each of our uh, health department experts come back on and discuss um, one of three topics. So um, first I'd like to invite Wendy uh, back and um, talk a little bit more about what we know about the Omicron variant. So Wendy, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of questions as well now that we're seeing it um, more prevalent in Northern Michigan. What can you tell us? Sure. Uh, can we go to the second, the next slide? Um, so what I what we know right now is, is many of us have been notified from the state lab that we do have confirmed Omicron cases in the region. Uh, we know that this is the tip of the iceberg. So looking at those counties, we have Antrim, Charlevoix, Leelanau, Grand Traverse, Nuego, and I think there's been a county or two on the, the east side of Northern Michigan as well. Um, so what that does is basically indicate to us that we're starting to see, um, as Dr. Morse described, um, that Omicron is going to become the more prevalent strain. It's going to take over the Delta. Um, and we're seeing that through this rapid surge in, in the increase of numbers, Omicron is definitely very highly transmissible. Um, and so it just re results in a larger volume of cases um, and that taxes a lot of the resources for everyone, not just health departments and hospitals, but you know everyone businesses as well with staffing. Um, testing becomes imp you know, important to identify early, but again, testing supplies and staffing for the testing is, is a challenge as well. And just the volume of cases um, does result in um, maybe hospital volumes staying up. Uh, although we are starting to see that, you know, the emerging data has uh, that those who experience Omicron infections are likely to have less severe symptoms, particularly if they're uh, fully vaccinated and boosted. So that's, that's a good thing, but with the volume we're seeing, it's still just a volume of cases. Um, also, there's a limited supply of the monoclonal antibodies that are um, working against Omicron that are effective and as well as treatment options. So, you know, ultimately the best protection really um, for anyone is to prevent exposures and reduce the risk of becoming infected. And so the four things that you can do are uh, get vaccinated for Omicron, including getting boosted if, if you're due to get boosted. Um, the timeline uh, for boosting has reduced recently from six months to five months for both um, Pfizer and Moderna, as well as the, I think the five to 11 year old population and then the 16 and up population. Um, in an indoor setting, uh, continue to wear a mask. That There's been a state advisory regarding masking as well as uh, CDC guidance strongly recommending it. And then, um, before you're going to gather, if you have any symptoms, even if it seems like just a mild cold, um, a lot of people who are feeling like they have mild cold systems are testing positive. And if you test once and it's negative and you continue to have symptoms, we definitely would recommend that you test again um, because there are some people who maybe test too soon 
and it doesn't quite pick up the viral load needed for a positive test. So just uh, keeping those things in mind to protect yourself and protect those who are around you. I think those are the, the key points on Omicron, other than to say that um, we've had some questions about the tests. So the tests do detect um, COVID, whether it's the Delta strain or the Omicron strain. So the, the test can detect it. Um, whether or not it is actually sequenced though is a little bit different. So the state lab uh, does a random sample of about 10% of the, all the labs that are taken through the state. Um, and so those are then tested, but it's, again, it's a random sample. Um, I think if there's indication from say a health department or a hospital that we have something that we really think is Omicron and early on we could you know, encourage that that one additionally be tested. But now that we know it's here, um, it'll just continue to be a random sample. And again, that does take 10 to 14 days. So by the time we know that what you specifically have is Omicron, you will likely be out of your isolation at that point, so. Thank you, oh. Wendy. My points. Wendy, um, just a couple of related questions that we've been getting through um, our Q&A feed here related to Omicron. So, so two questions, um, and I'll ask them both. Uh, so the first one is, do we see another variant coming after Omicron? And um, the second related question is, I read in the news today about a new variant in Greece that shows elements of both Delta and Omicron. Has this been detected in the US? Can you comment on that, please? Um, to look at the crystal ball, uh, I would say, um, you know, likely we will see another variant. Um, we've continued to see variants as we've gone through the last two years. Um, which ones will pose a, a more of a problem or an issue to us, we will have to see. Um, so that, you know, that's about as much as I can say about that, but I think we do anticipate we will continue to see variants. Um, on the second question, I'm not aware that we've seen this combo. Um, uh, perhaps Dr. Nefsi is aware of Dr. Morse, but I, I haven't heard that yet. Great, thank you. And we will, uh, I have not heard that either. So we will continue to track that and um, see what develops from that. So thank you, Wendy. Um, we will uh, move on to our next topic now and have Wendy back for the Q&A. But uh, the next topic uh, that we get a lot of questions about is uh, testing. And uh, Lisa Peacock um, is going to kind of walk us through some of the uh, latest information and the and reminders um, related to testing. Lisa, are you there? Thanks, Diane. I am here. I can't open my video though. It says the okay. host has to do it. Oh, you know what? Let me help you with that. Hold on one Yay. second here. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, there we go. oh, thank you. <laughs> I got to start it now. There we go. Um, so thanks for that, Diane. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, there are two different types of tests, big categories of tests that detect COVID, and there's lots of different brands within those two categories. But the two categories are PCR tests and antigen tests. PCR tests are the tests that get sent to a lab and they're processed in a lab generally. Um, there are some rapid forms of the PCR tests that are also in use at, at some facilities like urgent cares or, or certain clinics. Um, and really, you know, they both have a really important purpose in the world of testing. PCR tests are more sensitive um, and they certainly, you know, they, they pick up and look at the genetic material that's within the viral particle. Um, and so they're really useful in a lot of different situations. Um, they're highly sensitive. And so when people are not um, symptomatic, sometimes the PCR will pick up a positive um, before an antigen would. Um, but the antigen tests are rapid. They're, the results are generally available right away within 15 minutes. And they you know, have an important purpose as well. They detect certain proteins from the viral particle, but they um, are, are a test that's best used in a situation where someone is, is symptomatic um, or they're often used in um, settings where we're doing serial testing, testing once a week or testing at certain intervals like schools or sometimes um, uh, congregate settings that are at high risk for outbreak and we need to be able to, to detect positives very quickly. So antigens are really convenient and helpful in lots of situations. PCR tests are, are more sensitive and sometimes are required for certain things like travel may require a PCR result. 
Um, we have to think ahead for the PCR results um, because they're sent to a lab. So the results aren't typically available right away. Um, and right now, you know, often it takes 24 to 48 hours. It depends on the lab that you're using. We are seeing extended um, you know, times needed to release those results though now, because it's just based on the volume of testing, um, all of the labs are experiencing some strain in this area. You can go to the next slide. So, um, you know, people who should get tested um, for COVID include people who are having symptoms. Um, with the presence of the Omicron variant, we are seeing more mild symptoms. So we really are encouraging people to get tested if they, are even fully boosted, but they're having even mild symptoms like a cold, congestion, sneezing, runny nose, um, sore throat, and then the more typical symptoms of COVID with a cough, shortness of breath, muscle aches, headache, um, that kind of thing. But even GI symptoms like diarrhea or nausea and vomiting can be a sign of COVID. So, you know, right now with the high transmission levels in our community, um, it is a good idea to get tested for COVID if you are having those symptoms, even um, as a precaution, just for the people around you and to make sure that you know if you have it because there is a, um, you know, an isolation period that's required. You can go to the next slide. So there are some people um, who are asymptomatic who should also get tested for COVID. Um, if you have had a close contact exposure, and again, with the high transmissibility of the Omicron variant, it is very likely um, that it can transmit from person to person. So if you've been in close contact, especially a household contact right now, we are recommending um, that people get tested at five days um, after they've had last contact with that person with COVID-19. And so, um, you know, that is, that is a really important category of people who should consider getting tested at one of our testing sites in the community. Um, there are some times that we are screening the community. Certainly the test results for um, COVID um, give us information about the virus. Um, some of those samples are being sequenced as Wendy talked about um, for different variants. And also just, it helps us know the prevalence of the, the virus in our community. It's what gives us those positivity rates and case rates that we're tracking. So testing continues to be important. Um, and then some people are required to be tested, maybe by their employer, schools are doing a lot of testing, um, and you know there are a lot of reasons that we may require someone to have a test. You can go to the next slide. The, there is a category of people who don't need to worry about testing, and generally they are people who have been exposed um, to someone with COVID, but they've had COVID themselves within the past three months. So if you have tested positive for COVID within the last three months and you don't develop new symptoms, even if you have an exposure, you do not have to be tested. So um, we get that question a lot, um, but you know the data is showing that we do have some protective immunity during those first three months after infection. And I think that's all I have. Oh, testing resources. So um, there are, you know, like I, I pointed out during my earlier um, remarks that our health department websites all have, um, and Munson as well, all have information on where you can get tested. Um, the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line is really a great resource for our communities and so is the Michigan COVID hotline. So um, look to those resources when you're looking for a site to be tested. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that update or that reminder, because the it is very confusing sometimes um, when you don't uh, think about this kind of stuff every day. So appreciate those updates. Um, the last topic that we get quite a bit of questions about um, are the CDC guidelines for isolation and quarantine. Um, and Dr. Morse um, has agreed to walk us through what we know today um, and what people should be thinking about um, if they test positive or have an exposure. Thanks, Dr. Morse. Yeah. So we understand this is extremely confusing and this is a lot of information. So I would really encourage you to just remember if you have questions, if you've been exposed, if you test positive, if you have symptoms, um, where to find this information on the CDC. If you go to cdc.gov slash coronavirus or just simply Google CDC COVID, um, on their main page, there's a bar at the top. The left side says your health. Below that, there's a drop down. It says if you are sick. If you click that, below that, you'll find a tab that says um, quarantine and isolation. Click that, and you'll find all this information. Um, again, this is really confusing. 
It's a lot of information. So I just encourage you to go there and look. Um, basically, the CDC understanding that so many people are sick and exposed right now, um, that if you remember over the holidays, things weren't able to function, um, trying to find a better, safer way to shorten things, um, have given some options. Um, if you have been exposed to COVID, which again, is being less than, than six feet apart from somebody for more than 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So if you were close to somebody at work at five minute intervals over a day, regardless of mask use, um, that would be considered an exposure. So if you're not up to date on your vaccines, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's different than being fully vaccinated. I know there's um, a lot of different terminology here, but if you're not up to date on your vaccines, which just essentially means if you've not gotten every vaccine you could possibly get um, per the recommendations, they do recommend now that you stay home for at least five full days. Um, and then while you're at home or, and around others during those five days, so if you do have to leave your house, say to get groceries or go to the doctors, make sure you wear a well-fitted mask. Um, and they do recommend that you get tested after five days um, just to see if you have happened to have been infected, even if you don't have symptoms. So that's similar to previous recommendations. Um, after that five days, continue to watch for symptoms and wear a well-fitting mask for the next five days at least. Again, remember, Given our current prevalence, you should be wearing a well-fitting mask all the time when you're out in public. So even after 10 days, you should still wear a well-fitting mask at all times in public. If you happen to get symptoms at any time during that 10 days or in the future, um, you should isolate immediately and get tested. So if you tested negative at day five, on day seven, you get symptoms, get back in your home, get tested, wait for your test results. During that 10 days after you were exposed, regardless of whether or not you have symptoms, again, keep wearing your mask. You should avoid travel just so you don't spread germs inadvertently. And if you have family members who are elderly or at high risk, immunosuppress, things like that, try to avoid contact with them as well. Again, just because this time frame has been shortened, you could still be contagious, you could still be infected and not know it and, and pre-symptomatic. Um, so this is an effort to shorten the time people may need to quarantine, but be as careful as possible. But it does not necessarily mean that you're free of any risk in that day six through 10. Okay, next slide. So if you are up to date on your vaccines and you've been exposed to somebody or you've had a case of COVID-19 in the past 90 days that was diagnosed with a test like a PCR test or an antigen test um, and you are exposed, then you don't need to quarantine unless you develop symptoms. But again, you should continue to watch for symptoms. You should wear a well-fitting mask. You should avoid travel, avoid those who are at high risk. And if you get symptoms at any point, isolate right away and seek out testing. The only time where testing is not indicated um, Oh, it is recommended you get tested five days after the exposure, even if you don't have symptoms, unless you have had a prior infection in that last 90 days. That's where it gets a little confusing. Um, there's concerns that you may have a false positive. So if you don't have symptoms and you've been infected previously within the last three months, you don't need to get tested again. If you do develop symptoms, talk to your healthcare provider while you stay isolated to see if you should get tested or not. Um, again, we know this is really confusing. If you have questions, talk to your healthcare provider. Next slide. So in terms of being up to date, it essentially means that based on the current guidelines, have you gotten every possible shot you could get? Um, we know that's really confusing because the guidelines seem to change every other week, um, but basically we just want you to be as protected as possible. So right now it's everyone five and older has gotten a primary series, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J, &J, um, based on the age. So people that are five to 17, it would be two doses of Pfizer, 
for those 18 and older, it would be two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of Johnson & Johnson. And it's been at least two weeks after that. For some individuals, if they have a compromised immune system, there is a third dose recommended to complete that primary series. And then for those that are, it's a little confusing, but if you're over 12 years of age, then you should also have had a booster um, five months later. And if it's more than five months later and you had Moderna, you could also get Moderna. Um, if you've had Johnson & Johnson, you should have had a second one after two months, or you could have had a Pfizer or Moderna after two months because you can mix and match. So basically, whatever you're eligible or it's recommended you get, you've gotten it on time and you're not overdue. If you're overdue for any of the recommended vaccines, you're not considered up to date and you should quarantine. None of these recommendations affect the isolation requirements, just the quarantine requirements. Um, so in terms of isolation, if you have symptoms or you've tested positive. So again, just having symptoms, the recommendation is to quarantine, or sorry, to isolate. So if you have symptoms or have tested positive, you need to stay home in isolation for at least five days. Um, when you're around others in your home, you should wear a well-fitting mask. Um, if you have had symptoms, you can leave your home after those five full days. Day zero is the first day you had symptoms or the day your test was done if you did not have symptoms. Um, but after that fifth day, so on day six, you can leave your home as long as your symptoms have largely improved um, and you have not had a fever for at least 24 hours without the aid of a medication to lower your fever. If you're still having a lot of symptoms or you're still having fever, you need to stay in isolation until you're feeling better and you've not had a fever. If you were seriously ill, which means you were in the hospital um, or you have a really bad immune system, you need to talk to your healthcare provider um, because you often stay contagious for a lot longer and they'll help you decide when you can leave your home. Again, you don't stop being contagious after those five days. It's just a lot less likely you will be. So once you leave your home, you've got to wear a well-fitting mask for the full 10 days. Um, and if you can't wear a mask, you need to stay home for the full 10 days. You should avoid travel and avoid being around people who are at high risk of complications from infection. Um, so that's very critical. Um, this is a way to help get people out and about sooner but it's not saying that you're safe and not going to infect people. So this is just kind of reviewing some rationale. The CDC does have a, a nice discussion as to why they're doing this. Um, it's very long and wordy, but it's a good explanation. But they really do point out that this was a reflection of the societal impact. Basically, uh, so many people were out of work because of the amount of people sick or in quarantine um, that something needed to be done to help that. And we do have good evidence that people are most contagious two days before they show symptoms and three days after they show symptoms. Um, however, we do know that contagion can go on for many days, up to 10 days. And we really don't have any evidence showing that Omicron is different in that regard. So this is basically following that the majority of people are most contagious in the beginning but the CDC clearly states that one third of people are still contagious after day five. So please do not do this if you cannot wear a mask after day five. So, Thank you, Dr. That was Morris. My yep, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that was a lot of really great um, information uh, and recap. I think you took a lot of very complicated information and made it very easy to understand. So we encourage you to, uh, we will post these slides on our website if you need to re-reference them. This information is also available on the CDC website. And I believe the CDC also has a, an online tool that can help you determine if you should be tested and um, what your um, isolation or quarantine uh, recommendations are. So thank you.
Um, unfortunately, um, you know, we did want to take the time today in the in the press conference to get to those three topics because they were the most frequently asked questions we were getting. Unfortunately, that has left us um, with. Uh, no time for our Q&A session today. However, um, if you did submit a question, um, especially our reporters, we will try to connect you um, with the data and some of the answers uh, to your questions that you've had. Um, otherwise, um, we will take all of this information and all the questions you've asked this week and see if we can address any of them um, at next week's press conference. Um, but just in closing today, I just want to, first of all, Thank our uh, speakers today. I want to thank Dr. Nefsi, Wendy Hershenberger, Lisa Peacock, and, and Dr. Morse for taking uh, time to do this to help uh, keep the public updated. Um, as always, we have uh, we always point to our community resources. Um, there were many of them mentioned throughout our press conference today, but here's a nice uh, summary slide. This is also posted on MunsonHealthcare.org. Um, and just as a reminder, we encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletter, follow us on social media, uh, visit MunsonHealthcare.org, and please um, you take advantage of the Ask a Nurse line at 231-935-0951. It's a great resource for our community. Um, so again, apologize for not getting to uh, the Q&A today, but uh, we will definitely have a Q&A session uh, at next week's press conference. Our health department partners will not be on uh, next week, uh, but we will uh, try to line up some experts from Munson Healthcare to uh, continue our conversation. Um, in the meantime, stay healthy, stay well, and uh, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to us. Thanks and have a great day.